Roomy. Not just an adjective, it's a name. Uh, it's actually not his name. Jalal al-Din Muhammad Bakti or Rumi. Uh, Thirteenth century Persian poet, one of the most successful poets in the history of Persia and in, quite frankly, the history of the world. Had a, uh, has had a real renaissance in the last few decades in translations around the world for uh, uh, his particular brand of spirituality writ large. Spirituality kind of not separated from, but encompassing religiosity. So we see uh, some similar dynamics to some of the examples we see in other uh, medieval poetry where the tenets of established religion are called into question because of their uh, a kind, well, because of their asceticism, because of their rejection uh, of uh, the, the physical side of humanity. He was a, uh, in effect, a founder of the, uh, the particular belief of Sufism, um, which is a aspect of Islam that is based on mysticism and spirituality and tends to move away from terribly many, uh, a lot of the physical restrictions that you find in a lot of religions in general and in this case, in, uh, in Islam in particular. The, uh, this is also especially uh, present within the Sunni Muslim tradition. Uh, there are some Shia as well within that. And it generally, uh, it generally uh, tracks with a less materialistic view of, uh, of, of spirituality where the things of this world, and here it's a little different than we, uh, than we see in some of the, uh, the Christian examples of uh, medievalism, where the things of this world just don't matter at all. This is a much more, uh, this is tracking much more readily with the, uh, the, uh, the traditions of Asia, quite frankly. Uh, I think in terms of non-attachment in uh, the Hindu tradition, or the uh, the Taoist principles of uh, uh, of spirituality and the irrelevance of the material world. Um, it is a focus primarily on uh, the inner self, a belief that what you have inside you is inherently divine. And you, the purpose of life and the purpose of religion is to tap into that spirituality. And so you, if you have that kind of divinity within you, you don't necessarily need to find it outside of you. So here it becomes much more uh, destabilizing for the institutions of religion and, quite frankly, society in general. The idea that you are inherently good is a radical suggestion when institutions are set up to keep you restrained. And that dynamic you can see play out in, uh, in all of his work. Now, his work is essentially, he was very prolific. His work is essentially uh, divided up into two books, primarily. One is called The Divan, and that is just his collected poems, and that's largely what we have in our selection here. But then the other part of uh, what we have here is from an enormous book called The Masnavi, 
which is in a Persian tradition seen as a kind of founding epic, not unlike the Iliad would function for Greece. And it is it's not the epic poem that uh, that we are accustomed to in the Homeric tradition, where it tells a grand story, but rather it tells a variety of stories, a variety of anecdotes almost, with some uh, with a great uh, spiritual thread running through them, so that by the end of the reading you have gone on a kind of spiritual journey from point A, human corruptibility or whatever, to point B, which would be divine grace. Um, the Masnavi is very, very long. I have not read the whole thing. I don't expect to. I don't have that kind of time. But it is a, uh, an extraordinary work to just, if you see, it's very difficult to get a complete one, but if you see a, uh, you know, a, uh, an abridged version here or there, it's worth flipping through, just you know, for the staggering quality of the, uh, the poetry sometimes. Um, take a look at uh, some of these short lyrics. The night I spend with you, love will not let me sleep. The nights I lie alone, I lie awake and weep. With you or without you, God knows I stay awake. But look what different forms a sleepless night can take. Well, uh, a little sexy. A little sexy, gotta say. The nights I spend with you, love will not let me sleep. <laughs> The nights I lie alone, I lie awake and weep. With you or without you, God knows I stay awake. But look what different forms a sleepless night can take. This is interesting. It shows a frankness about uh, sexuality. It shows a frankness about desire and the perhaps lust for sexuality when sexuality is not immediately available. Uh, but also the fact that God is aware of both of these things and doesn't seem to draw much of a distinction between them. God knows I stay awake. That's the bottom line for God. That's the takeaway. One way or the other, whether you are tortured with despondency because your love is not there, or whether you are not tortured because your love is there. Either way, doesn't seem to matter to God. God seems okay with that. Um, but the idea also of virginity, of resistance to sexuality, that is such a cornerstone of so many faiths, quite frankly. Here, eh, a little bit more ambivalent. The, uh, the only conclusion you can draw is that the whole idea of virginal piety, I'm saving myself for, for God. I'm keeping clean for God. That's a human constraint. It's a human policy, not a divine one. God doesn't seem to care. Everything that is human in this construction then is kind of pointless, getting in the way. His relationship with God is untouched. Like blood beneath my skin, within my veins, love came. Now emptied of myself, my friend fills all my frame. My friend fills out my limbs, my life. But all I am and all that still remains of me is me's my name. I like how it sort of dribbles into hysteria at the end. 
There is another, like blood beneath my skin, another reference to specific physicality within my veins. Love came. This is could this could be love of uh, romantic love. This could be divine love. One way or the other, it is expressed in a physical form. It is expressed like fire beneath the veins, which is another sort of shout out to Catullus. I don't know that he's read Catullus, but sort of like that. Actually, technically, it's him copying the Greek poet Sappho. Fire beneath your skin. That sense of sexual excitement, that sense of sensuality that here is validated. Profession, profit, trade, or what we've burned, song, poetry, and verse, or what we've learned. We've given heart and soul and sight to love, and heart and soul and sight are what we've earned. Spiritual devotion is its own reward. That sense of earning this for that is almost silly. That sense of behaviorism. If I pray this many times a day, I'll get a pellet from God. I'm like a mouse in a maze. Doesn't it seem silly when you look at it that way? A rose is still a rose wherever it might grow, and wine is always wine wherever it might flow. And if the sun should rise up in the western skies, the sun is still the sun wherever it might rise. Hmm. Do we think he's talking about the sun rising? Well, a rose is still a rose. I'll point out that this is before Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet. Uh, a rose is still a rose wherever it might grow. True, I suppose. But let's just take that and assume it's a metaphor. Assume it's a symbol for something, a representation for something, and saying that something good and beautiful can sprout anywhere and still be good and beautiful. Anywhere like a different country? A different nationality? Different church? Uh, when you read this part, this reminds me from the first poem that we read today, that it's uh, talking about the woman that besides all the saints and all that, they're still women and they created God. Yeah. All of the rules that you see built around uh, or built around a belief system are rules made by man. And if they're made by man, well, you know, human beings are stupid. Not divine. But here the access to the divinity supersedes all of that. A rose is still a rose no matter where it is. Wine is always wine wherever it might flow. All of these things have their inherent qualities of beauty and integrity irrespective of our limits on them, our definitions of them. So transpose that into a spiritual realm and you get non-denominationalism. God is always God everywhere. Spirituality is always spirituality everywhere. The specific forms it might take are all human designed and thus kind of eh, vulnerability to error? Question. Maybe uh it was not constructed by man itself, but it was reconstructed by men. Let's say they took whatever was outside and they formed this, like, you know, this idea. Yeah. 
This, the, the pushback against this idea is that, well, God inspires mankind to come up with these rules you know, it's the it's the the image of Exodus and uh, the uh, God writing on the tablets for Moses and handing down the laws. Those laws, uh, those are all human laws. But when you're told that God Himself etched them in stone, then that changes the calculation a little. Here he's saying that you know God isn't necessarily writing anything of these laws, the relationship to God transcends all of those limitations, all of those specific practices that have to do with human behavior. And so you can reject them. You can reject the limitations on your human behavior. Your relationship to God, the spirituality within you itself, is all that matters. Yeah. I believe that we read something about how a king or an emperor chose, uh, chose the word of God to control his citizens. Like they, he molded it on a way that it benefited him. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everything we have read this semester is about that. About, you know, human beings appropriating and you could argue corrupting the uh the the authority of god in one form or another for their own benefit those are all human concerns whenever this is saying that whenever you're seeing a set of rules that are trying to matter trying to meld your human behavior to modify what you can do and what you can't do that is human and kind of irrelevant. All that matters is that sense of the spirituality that transcends all of that, that gives you a direct link to God and not just a trans, trans, ah, translation of God into human terms through rules and dogma and beliefs. Like faith. Yeah. Trust something that you cannot see or touch. Yeah. Faith. The uh, responding to an unknown with positivity. Because on the Bible it says that there will be many false prophets. Sure. I think we've seen a few. Uh, the Bible, yeah, will. Uh, False prophets are always a problem. False prophets are almost always human beings. People who uh, claim to have their own direct line to God that supersedes everybody else's says, God talks to me, and he tells me that I'm special. So I'm on a first-name basis with him. You guys, nah. You've never, you've never really gone out for a beer with him like I have. And so that can, that's human motivation because those people almost always are using that for their own materialistic gains. Here, this is putting all of that aside. Look at how marvelous that moment when we'll sit so splendidly, you and I, two substances, two bodies, a single soul's identity, you and I. That moment when we enter in love's orchard, the colors of the flowers, the voices of the birds will, meet, will give us immortality, you and I. The stars that come to gaze upon us, and we shall show the splendor of, this mo of the moon to them in that immensity, you and I. Then you and I, no longer you and I, will be united by our love, happy and safe from all foolishness set free, you and I. Oh, how the throng of heaven's birds will sing to us when we sit smiling, laughing there so happily, you and I, and we'll be in two places then, surrounded here with sweetness and seated too in paradise eternally, you and I. Obviously, the thing that jumps out at this, you and I.
that refrain just repeated again and again and again. I don't think that's an accident. I don't think that's just a quirk. I think it is a chant. Now, if you've ever, and again, go online and you can find these things. You find the original, chanted in the original language. And Rumi is a master of meter. Quite frankly, some of the stuff he's doing up there doesn't really work with rhyme like, uh, like European poets, but the meter is very intoxicating, very chant-like. Quite frankly, when he picks up the tempo and you get the reading going along quite well, it, it sounds like rap, quite frankly. It is that sort of intoxicating, swelling entity of beauty. But that you and I, you and I, you and I, that repeated refrain throughout, that is the takeaway. If you read all of the individual lines, it's about unity. It is two substances, two bodies, a single soul's identity. Yes, it's you, it's me, but we are one. You and I, you and I, you and I. Together, the focus in that you and I is on the end, quite frankly. It is about unity, not hierarchy, not distinction. It's about we are all the same in spirit. On death's day, when you see my coffin bear me, do not think that this word's pain can, ins can still ensnare me. Don't weep and don't say, alas, alas, in your despair. With that, alas, you've tumbled into the devil's snare. And when you see my corpse, don't say, he's lost, he's lost, since that's when I'll be welcomed home and found at last. And as you bury me, don't say, farewell, farewell, the grave is but a veil to where our spirits dwell. And as you see me laid to rest, you'll know, know I'll arise, since the sunset means the moon will soar into the skies. You'll see the sunset, but it is the dawn you see. The tomb seems like a jail, but sets the spirit free. What seed goes in the ground and does not grow again? You should... Sh why should you think the seed of man is different then? What bucket lets down in a well that, that in a well does not rise full? Why mourn the soul that waits like Joseph in its well? When you have ceased to grieve, employ your voice elsewhere, since all your grieving means no more than empty air. What's that? <laughs> if it wasn't so long, I'd say it would work great on a tombstone. <laughs> but that's a lot of lettering, and the, that can get expensive. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, you, it is. What's that? True, that's good, a QR code, excellent. Um, yeah. And, and it's a very identifiable notion. You know, don't be sad for me yeah. now that I'm dying or that I am dead. I told them to not go to church with my body. Yeah, just, you know. Uh, I died, just go to church. I told my kids, uh, I, I will do my best to die on garbage day. Just drag me to the curb. <laughs> um, <laughs> they would. Uh, <laughs> Maybe not the middle one. The other two, definitely. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the idea is very accessible. The idea, well, writ large, the idea is don't worry about dogma. Don't worry about, you know, all, all of this stuff. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about missing me even or being sad for me. That's silly. I am being freed of worldly cares, and this is the point. Everything of this world is corrupting and uh, bad. So I will be set free on death's day. And 
it's a beautiful notion. It, it, and it's so human in its way. And just think about, like, in contrast to some of the, uh, the Christian medieval stuff that we were reading, this is very accessible. There's not a lot of footnotes that you need with this. It's universal. And that's the point, too. He's speaking in very plain terms, very simple language to matters of universal concern. Everybody's going to die. Everybody has, everybody's going to see a loved one die. And these questions crop up all the time. So he is speaking in a way that does away with boundaries, does away with national distinctions, does away with class distinctions, gender distinctions, does away with all that, and said we're all just the same in the eyes of God. And so that is the way this is written. There's very little highfalutin language. There's very little that's not perfectly and immediately understandable in this. And that's the point. When you're having a hard time understanding something that you're reading, there's a reason for that. When you're having an easy time understanding something you're reading, there's a reason for that. And just starting from there gives you an insight into what the poem is really saying. No? Okay. There's one that, uh, well, there's a couple that I want to go through that uh, are not in the book, but I think are instructive. And again, I'll just read them. I adore not the cross nor the crescent. I am not Christian nor Jew, not from Eden or pa and paradise I fell, not from Adam my lineage I draw. In a place beyond uttermost peace, in a tract without shadow or trace, soul and body transcending, I live in the soul of my loved one anew. I'm not a Christian or a Jew. I don't worship the cross or the crescent, Islam. You can't define me. I ascribe to a spirituality that transcends all of these distinctions, that dispenses with all of those human things, boundaries. Yes, excellent. Um, soul and body transcending, I live in the soul of my loved one anew. I don't think he's talking about a wife there. I think the loved one there is the spirit of divinity. Um, but a different approach to this that is theoretically consistent. Another poem. We have become drunk and our heart has departed it has fled from us, whither has it gone? When it saw that the chain of reason was broken, immediately my heart took to flight. It will not have gone to any other place. It has departed to the seclusion of God. Seek it not in the house, for it is of the air. It is the bird of the air. It has and has gone into the air. It is the white falcon of the emperor. It has flight and departed to the emperor. Throwing some shade at uh, the emperor, political, human jurisdiction uh, in favor of God. It will not have gone to any other place. It has departed to the seclusion of God. It's disdaining the things of this world. But I like that first line also. We have become drunk and our heart is departed. It has fled for us. Whither has it gone? The idea of becoming drunk, not necessarily here, uh, physically drunk, but a kind of spiritual ecstasy, which is part and parcel to the mysticism embedded in, uh, in the Sufi, uh, 
the Sufi religion, if you will. Uh, but then compare that with evil won't always come from a loss of self-control. Wine makes a person ruder who has rudeness in his soul. A wise man, when he drinks, will seem to grow more clever. An evil-natured man will turn out worse than ever. But since most men's behavior is an absolute disgrace, wine has become forbidden to everyone, just in case. Uh, a devout Muslim is forbidden alcohol. And here, as a devout Sufi Muslim, he is drawing that distinction and saying, that's silly. That is another example of human policy trying to control human behavior that has nothing necessarily to do with God. It's got that cheeky little line at the end. Wine has become forbidden to everyone just in case. Wine isn't bad, it just makes bad people more public. You know, you put a few drinks into a good person, eh, they're kind of funny. And of course, there is a long-standing tradition in many religions, and we've spoken about this, of wine, alcohol in general, elevating the spirit, removing it from the worldly mundane realm and casting it on the spiritual ideal. If outwardly you rule a woman like water that has drowned her, while inwardly you rule, you're ruled by her, struggling until you've found her, this is man's nature. Animals don't have such sentiments. The prophet said that women rule those with intelligence, while ignorant and stupid men rule women when they can. They're savage beasts within and lack the qualities of men. Kindness, affection, these are traits that show humanity, while lust and anger are a sign of bestiality. A woman's not your love. She is God's light. This is her nature. She's the creator. You could say that she is not a creature. That last line is really quite the kick in the head. Woman is a creator, not the created. In a way, in a very real way, he's arguing and making a real point for doing away with the hierarchy and distinctions between man and woman, between the artificial, socially mandated human construction uh, of misogyny and saying well, women are just as good and terrible as we are. The line between them is silly. Man's life compared to that of an embryo in the womb. If someone told an embryo in the womb, there's a wide world outside with endless room, delightful and well-ordered and replete with many different tasty things to eat. Long roads and endless plains, oceans are there, o orchards, gardens, meadows everywhere, a sky that's high above and filled with light. There's sunlight, moonlight, and the stars of the night. Its marvels can't be put in, world, in words, so why, instead of staying put here, don't you try to get away from this dark prison where you feed on blood and live beset with, with care? The embryo would say the man was trying to trick him and deceive him with his lying. It couldn't picture what it's told. Its mind and understanding are completely blind. And so it is when saints describe to men the other world that lies beyond their ken and say this world's a pit as dark as night, while that word, world's substance, substanceless and filled with light. Their ears won't take it in. Their nature's being is a thick veil that prevents their seeing just as the embryo longs to feed on blood since where it dwells now bloods its only food and fed by blood alone it stays deprived of knowledge of the world that lies outside interesting reversion of birth birth is a transition from 
one state to another. And here, clearly, setting up that when you were born into this world physically, uh, you could look at it two ways, good or bad. But that same process is reversed when you were born into the second phase. When you achieve pure spirit, when you can leave behind the physical cares, you enter into heaven, nirvana. That's the core of the Sufi theology. But for our purposes, this poem and all of this work is, uh, well, it is a kind of proselytizing a sales pitch, if you will, looking for recruits, as some people might call it. Very plain language, very simple imagery, very human concerns, universal concerns that tell us that we are not all many different kinds of people, but that we are all people. And that is a enticing idea and he is trying to spread this and he was remarkably effective at spreading this around the Islamic world and to this day as I said before it is remarkably effective spreading beyond any national borders Rumi is one of the most translated and best-selling poets in the world today. There's a kind of, you know, easy breezy spiritualism. Hey, I can't be nailed down. I'm I guess you can't say I'm religious, I'm spiritual. There is that going on here. And it's got kind of a, you know, California hey dude vibe almost. But the appeal is undeniable. And if you just take it on that basis and say, okay, he is making a very serious case here and he's presenting it in a serious way. The poetry is remarkably effective in communicating what he is trying to say. It is very beautiful on many regards. There are some little aesthetic flourishes in there that are fun and at times quite lovely. But just as a piece of rhetoric, as a piece of pure communication, it is powerfully delivered. The authenticity of his experience is one thing, and give him all credit for that. The, uh, the strength of his theology is something else. All credit for that. Many people have very authentic religious experiences and very comprehensive and significant intellectual breakthroughs. But they can't write like this. They can't communicate it like this. They can't reach other people with it to bring them in. And when you are talking about a poetry or about a message rather, that is about bringing people in and knocking down barriers and making access to a kind of spirituality, a kind of spiritual truth as simple as breathing. That universality is a skill. You have to speak in a universal language and this poetry does that. 